We're going to be uh, bringing up Technasia's own Gwendolyn Tan right now to uh, dig in a little bit deeper and do a fireside chat. How about, give it up, let her know, everybody. Gwendolyn, thank you. She's awesome. Thank you, Mingliang. Thanks for the keynote. Sure. So, for Razor, can we go back a little bit? Because you were not trained as, a, as an engineer, you know, as a business. You studied law, right? Yes. So can you talk about, about the aspect, why do you choose law? How do you quit law and start Razor? Well, I did law because my mom told me to do law. <laughs> the typical Singaporean. Hey, come on, come on. Everybody, <laughs> you know. Um, but he's no, the entrepreneur I, I, did, I did enjoy the law. You know, to be, to, be, to be candid, I enjoyed the law. I loved the law. Um, but... Uh, I've always been a gamer and I've always been passionate about playing computer games and uh, it was just one of those things where I said, life is short and I just want to do something different. So how did you meet your co-founder back then? Well, we met actually playing computer games. I mean, he was uh, you know, on the servers and stuff like that. He was really active. So today he's a bit, uh, he's uh, kind of semi-retired at this point of time, but um, you know, he was one of my best friends. In the, he is one of my best friends in the US and uh, we got together virtually, got to know each other. Um, I flew over, I've been, I was a bit of like a semi-pro um, well, back in the game, we used to call it, uh, back in the day, we used to call it pro gaming. Today, they call it eSports. Uh, played a lot of uh, Quake and uh, Unreal Tournament and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm still pretty good, I think. How, of, how much of your time do you spend playing games now? Uh, and building products for the company? So the problem is because we've got Razer comms at this point of time where, you know, people can see when I fire up a game and stuff like that, like Min Liang is now playing Civilization or something like that. Uh, and that's all market research. Yeah, it, uh, it's usually market research for the first uh, hour or so, but then after that, it's just, uh, it's just fun. Yeah, it's good. Life could <laughs> which, be worse. Which is a good thing. So one thing that um, Razer is popular for, I mean, you, you're definitely big, very super big in the gaming world, and one thing we always uh, we, we see is that some people have complained that sometimes Razer doesn't make products for some of the devices and consoles that they want. Yes. Yes. That's correct. So... Yeah. We know that you only make products that you, for consoles that you play. Yes. Well, I, I, I know where you're driving at because at one point in time I had a huge Twitter problem with uh, I'm PlayStation I'm referring exactly fans. to that yeah, tweet, yeah. Right. Um, so for context, at one point in time I did mention that uh, I was dusting off my PlayStation 3 to play uh, you know, The Last of Us, which is a great game, by the way. Um, but, uh, and I said one of the reasons why we don't really make PlayStation products is because I don't really play with my PlayStation product, uh, we use my PlayStation much, three, much. Uh, and that's the truth. I mean, we like to design products that we like to use. Um, I like to design products that I like to use and uh, it is what it is. So can you take, take us through kind of this thought process in developing our products? You know, how does it, how, do, how does a final product sh be shipped to the market and being used by gamers out there now? So anything from the, the initial idea, um, testing through several products because as part of this, I also know that you've been quoted, I think, in some media to say that you actually have, out of every four finished products, three are killed, one gets shipped to the market, sort of, something like that. Sure. Yeah, can you share a little bit more about that, the whole process? So I think the difference for us, um, and I was just talking about traditional hardware versus uh, uh, hardware 2.0, so to speak. We view hardware development a little bit more like software development. We like to iterate over and over and over again. Um, the problem is that the nature of hardware does not necessarily allow you to um, develop it like software. So as I was, I think I, I touched on it briefly a little earlier. Um, for example, there is this point of time which is called going to the tool. So when you go to the tool, essentially, for the benefit of everyone around here, if it's, um, it's like creating a, a mold for your plastics or, or stuff like that, you do your plastics injection, usually that is the largest um, and most expensive uh, point of time of the development. It's a fixed product and it's stuff that you can't change after that. The, the, you can't change the shape after that. It's very hard to change the, the, the way the products have been designed. And most companies stop short at that point of time. In Razor, we've got a saying that you're not a great um, designer until you destroy a tool. And it takes a lot of balls to go up and say, look, you know, I want to destroy a year's work and you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars or millions of dollars because I feel that this particular seam is not perfect. But that's something that we do. So we treat hardware development like software development. We think that a product is only finished when it's finished. We take our time with it. And uh, it can be incredibly expensive. So how long then is like, is there a median amount of time that a product from idea to, to market? So, you know, we've been, we've been founded about, uh, you know, coming to 10 years now. Um, and uh, we've got engineers in the company who have been around for about five or six years who have never shipped a product. It's a painful process, but 
that's it. You know, if a product can be killed right at the, the last moment, it, it is what it is. Would you recommend this kind of thinking for other kind of companies? Because this is, from my experience, this raises a kind of mode of thinking, of looking, of looking at things in this way. It's pretty unique. Yeah, it's a little different. Uh, I think we were uh, blessed to a certain extent um, being able to design. I think it wasn't... So I believe design isn't just about a product. It's a product. It's a package around a product. It's not just a package around a product. It's got to be on the shelf. It's not just shelf. It's the way you walk toward the shelf. It's... Before you even get to the product, you, you have an idea of what the product is going to be like. And on top of all of that, it's also designing the company, having the right people on the board, the right investors that aren't going to flip out and go berserk when you say, I'm going to destroy you know, the past three years of work because this is imperfect. So I think, in essence, we've been really lucky to have really great investors who, who believe in what we do. We've got great members of the team. We've built a culture of... Um, you know, being really proud of the product and, uh, you know, having a no-compromise approach to it. That's what we do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because um, I think for the audience here, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. And in terms of building companies, this type of, like, the question of building company culture, it's very important. Because you want to make sure that the, the company is focused also on like building good products, you know, driving revenue. But at the same time, you know, how do you balance that kind of revenue focus uh, mindset as well as making good products? Because you're, you're super making good products first in a sense. Sure. Revenue second seems like it to me. Would you agree? Well, we don't balance it. And I think we've been lucky you know, for the past couple of years not to have to balance it. And um, the, the problem is this. 90% of, um, or 99.99% of people say they want to, build great product. You know, ask any company and they will say that, I want to make great product. But you can see compromises happen in every single product out there. Because, you know, budgets, you know, somebody wants to meet a certain bomb price or a certain cost price. Um, somebody wants to go and have a beer after work and, and things like that. All these are compromises. Now, unfortunately, that is life. You know, building a company is no holds barred. If you don't have to, you know, if you have to stay in the damn office for months, weeks, years on an end, that's, that's how it is. And, you know, different people have different perspectives of things, but you make some sacrifices. If you had to describe the culture of Razor in three words, what three words would you use? Uh, wow, you're putting me a spot here. <laughs> no, uh, no, no. You're the guest. I think, you know, with a bit of a, well, cult will come first. We have a bit of a cult mindset of sorts that, you know, it's always about the team. And when we talk about the team, it's, it includes our, our customers, includes the gamers and, and all of that. I think second is really focus. So we're hyper-focused when we design a product that we strip away everything. We, we go for the single line and really look at, for example, designing the world's best you know, gaming laptop uh, or the thinnest, whatever. We, we, we strip it down to its bare basics and, and, and we're just totally hyper-focused on on, on that uh, end of things. And I think, you know, on the third part, it's really being um, focused on the gamer. You know, gamer being the third bit. It's one of those things where we've been approached by the military, we've been approached by healthcare to say, look, you know, you make really cool products to do this. You could make the company 10 times larger if you, you, know, if you started building products for, for a broader mass of people. But that's not what we're interested in. You know, we, have, we like what we do. We are profitable. We are cash flow positive. We, we don't need to raise capital and all that kind of stuff. We, we just, life is short. It's not about money. It's about designing the stuff that we really like. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff there that I want to ask you. Sure. <laughs> so for company now, when you talk about, you know, highly profitable and stuff like that, can you share a little bit about what's the future and what's your re how much re revenues you're doing, future for Razor? Uh, We've heard rumors about IPO and your, your valuation, you know, like being outwards of one billion. Can you, can you share more about that? Sure. We, uh, well, I, well uh, we are a private company, so we don't really disclose uh, numbers and, and, and things like that. Uh, we, I think from a revenues perspective, we're pretty open. We ship hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, revenues today. We are profitable. Um, but I think when it comes down to those rumors, uh, we, you know, it's... Uh, we're a private company, we don't really disclose. We are always considering options, I, I would say, um, at any point of time, but it's not something that drives us. We're just hyper-focused on, on building great product and we believe that the rest will really kind of follow. Okay, so 
to this part about kind of building great products and with your evolution of you know mice, keyboards, and now going in how is the new software, more wearables, can you talk about from a company building perspective, the product evolution, like how do you decide to move into this? I'm obviously from your keynote, we know that you believe, right? You know, hardware is a new software, there's more software style with the Nabu, your new wearable. Can you talk about the evolution of that? I think for us, it's been one of the, the ideas that we've always had from day one, that we want to build an incredibly great software platform that would really sync really well with the hardware side of things. And, and in essence, we were really talking about trying to create something truly difficult back in the day. And most of the guys were saying, as I've mentioned a little earlier, they said, look, it's already really difficult to build a, a great hardware company. Why are you trying to bite off more than you can chew by trying to connect every single thing back to the cloud and, and uh, do all of that? Um, but that, that has always been a vision of the company. You know, we want to be able to, to have that end-to-end -end communication, end-to-end -end experience. Um, that's one of the reasons why we've also done really crazy stuff where, um, you know, we started doing systems, uh, laptops, in a market where they say the PC business is on a huge decline. It is on a huge decline, but the only area that is growing dramatically at this point of time is gaming. So gaming is the doubling, tripling. Um, you can see the entire PC space going on and boom, you know, we are the ones, you know, growing dramatically at any point of time. You're talking about Project Christine, right? Uh, no. no. Well, we've got Blade, uh, yeah. which is our laptops. Um, we've got our tablets also at the same time. Uh, the difference is, it's a, we're really focused. And I, I, I believe that the trend of companies that um, are on a broad spectrum, on a horizontal level, will change. So, for example, you're looking at some of the traditional hardware guys that will do everything from, I will do something for the office, I will do something for the, for the um, uh, entertainment sector, you know, I've got something for this and that. Things are changing. So, for example, we are designed around our user, which is the gamer. We don't do anything else. For, the, for, uh, for example, are we t uh, could we do uh, the world's best office mouse? Probably. Could we do one of the, and do our, our laptops, some of the best laptops for productivity? Absolutely. However, we don't tell ourselves, oh, we, we don't get tempted to say, let me go try to make another $100 million of revenue from this or, or $500 million of revenue from that. We just say, we like the gamers, we know the gamers, we know we can design and build stuff for gamers, and that's what we do. Okay, so although the crowd here isn't particularly focused on gaming, I want to just... And you guys should be. <laughs> Yeah, we should all play. I, I don't game, I must admit, but okay. I tried out your Razer mouse. Sure, appreciate that. <laughs> so I wanted to go a little bit into that in, in the sense of um, when, when thinking about kind of, again, building the products and from a company perspective, how did a Naboo come out? How does it fit into a lifestyle of a gamer? So it's more gaming specific, yeah. Sure. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer and just kind of add on to what I've mentioned just now. We're not a gaming company. We're a company for gamers. And when we talk about being a company for gamers, we design everything that a gamer would be interested in. So, you know, we're one of the few companies that ship um, in the millions uh, of dollars uh, clothing. You know, you're talking about a tech company that does apparel, that people go out there and say, I love Razor clothing. And therein also lies with um, one of the things about wearables, right? There are some brands, tech brands, which I say, if I put it on a t-shirt, would you go out wearing a, a brand out there? I'm not going to name any names in case I get yelled at. But essentially, wearables to us was a natural progression because I'm constantly attached to my phone. I, I, I want a way to be able to stream my notifications all the way to my wrist and really all of that. But tech companies aren't great at shipping fashion products or, or wearable products. We are one of those curious tech companies that have been able to ship an incredible number of, um, you know, hats, shirts, and, and, and stuff like that out there. So how many products do you have now in total? And across, like, how many verticals, how many categories? So that's, so that's, that's one of the things that has um, made us very different. If, so we are not a peripherals company, nor are we a uh, laptop company, nor are we um, a company that has a, a category with multiple SKUs within. So if you put things in perspective, Everyone knows our mice, everybody knows our keyboards, a lot of uh, people are familiar with our headphones, our, uh, our laptops. We have essentially two models of a laptop. That's it. A laptop company would have like 50 different models at the same time. We've got two. We don't go for the, for the mass market, we just go for the best. Um, we've got two models of uh, keyboards. That's it. Everybody would go, wow, aren't you guys like having keyboards everywhere? No, we've got two models of keyboards and that's it. 
Same goes for most of the other things. So what we do is that we spread our stuff out in a pretty broad swath of uh, different categories. Okay. So specifically on Naboo, I'm curious in terms of the name. Okay. <laughs> the reason why some people are laughing is to give our, our foreign guests some context is that in, in Singaporean English and Singlish, Naboo in, um, it's part of a larger curse word. But at the same sure. time, but at the same time, at the same time, Nabu in uh, I think Babylonian is also the name of a god. That is correct, the god, exactly. the god of uh, wisdom. Yeah. So, okay. so which one? Which one was it? So we had a couple of names, uh, and because I get to choose the name, I thought it would be funny to, um, with a bit of uh, you know connection. Uh, given that I'm Singaporean, I was born in Singapore. Uh, you know, I thought it would be funny, you know, especially if we're shipping that and do all kinds of ads in Singapore and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I, okay, so thanks for that. So now, um, going back to, to kind put of... put that like, on record, right? <laughs> got that, right? So going back to kind of like building the team, and so you mentioned you're from Singapore, right? But you spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley as well, building Razor. Can you talk a little bit about how you split your time in managing the team? And how big is your team now, actually? We've got about 500 people um, spread out about uh, over nine offices. So for us, we haven't been really focused on... So most companies would, for example, be... Uh, have a domestic market, a large domestic market in the North America, etc. So a third of our business is in the US, a third of it is in Europe, and a third of it is in Asia. So the problem is, I, you know, we've got offices everywhere, um, we're headquartered out of uh, San Diego, you know, I spend a lot of time in our design center in San Francisco, our European headquarters is out of um, Hamburg, and uh, pretty much we've got offices in Singapore, China, so on and so forth. Um, we've got some really great managers um, on the ground, uh, that really deal with everything. And one of the people that I... I um, and we've got a bit of a virtual management team where, you know, uh, we would be connecting back on our own um, VoIP platform and chatting, doing our exec calls uh, at the same time. Uh, my COO is pretty much based out of Singapore. Um, an incredible gentleman who's got over 30 years of experience in manufacturing and, and really getting his, his um, feet wet and, and driving things at the fa factory, which is one of those things I would say is probably... I mean, core, he's my... COO is probably the guy that runs the company. I just have fun. So that's, that's pretty much what we, we, we have, um, a pretty disparate, uh, spread out kind of company at this uh, juncture. How is your hiring process? So do you hire each person individually? 500 is a lot, but it's not 10,000 yet. Sure. Do you hire each person individually? I think it depends from uh, company to company, uh, uh, office to office. So for example, we've got a... Uh, so we, we took in a team maybe a couple of years ago called uh, OQO, right? They, they used to make the, the smallest, the world's smallest um, form factor PCs. Uh, you know, they were funded with like a whole lot of money and, and uh, they, they had some incredible engineers. So they have got a really engineering mindset when they hire out of uh, San Francisco. Um, and different offices, for example, China would have a different approach to hiring. However, all of it is kind of predicated around gaming because gaming is also very universal Different um, countries will play different kinds of games. The focus, Brazil, is soccer games are a lot more, more um, uh, in fashion over there. You know, China, MMOs and stuff like that. So I would say that everything's built around the gamer and then it just kind of extends from there. And of course, the engineers would have you know, tougher engineering questions. The, um, uh, the marketing guys would have their own approach of doing things too. So to this topic of hiring, because I think, again, some entrepreneurs here would like to learn more about that. What are, for you, non-negotiable uh, yeah, negotiable factors when hiring? So, the, the bloody problem is that... Uh, I think that's the first curse word today, no? Oh, that's right. I've been controlling myself. So, uh, the problem is, is that in an interview, and that's the worst part about it, you know, it's very hard to, to discern what a person is truly like. Now, technical skills aside, so we, we have technical tests. So, for example, if um, we're hiring for, a, for an engineer, the engineers will all get together and they'll quiz them, whoever is coming in. It could be basically, you know, engineering questions, it could be all the kind of basic stuff. Um, the tougher part is really culture. So, like, one of the things that we really look for is, uh, look for our people that are really hyper-focused on creating great products. It's easy to say that you want to create great products, but the proof is really in the pudding when you really dedicate your life to pretty much a task of perhaps you want to find the best engineer who's interested in hinges or the best engineer who's interested in, in uh, screens, display technology. 
um, or the best engineers who are interested in paints. So, in essence, I think the hiring, the interview process is one of those that we, we've um, designed to try to weed out stuff like that. I mean, an interesting anecdote was um, back in the day, I know one of the officers do the kind of stuff. Um, halfway through the, the interview, somebody will pop his head in and, and tell the guy, usually, I mean, if let's say it's like uh, my engineering lead at that point of time, somebody pop his head, would pop his head in and, and congratulate the engineering lead to say, hey, you know, Eric, your wife has just... Uh, you know, delivered, given birth, and uh, we expect you to stay back, by the way, because we still need you to work on this kind of stuff. And, you know, he would just halfway through the interview say, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, I'll stay on. Um, uh, you know, and, um, that, and then we'll see the reaction of the other guy, you know, in the room. If the guy goes like, holy shit, what's going on, right? Then probably not the best guy for us. But we're really looking for people who are, who really have a, probably a religious approach to designing great products, and, and that's it. So 500 people now spread out across nine offices, you said? Yeah, pretty much. How about for the next, for the next like, 12 months? You know, what are your hiring plans for the company? So I think the challenge for us, we've had, had uh, lots of open positions. Um, we would like to double our headcount, but the challenge is not hiring the people, but it's really hiring the right people. Um, and that's pretty much the challenge for us right now. So for the next 12 months, for the Nabu. After that, are we expecting anything else? No, I'm going to pack up and go home. No, no. <laughs> so, on, so definitely. Us, yeah. I mean, the, the curious thing about Razor is that um, we are one of the, uh, in fact, actually, we are the only company that has won the most number of best of CESs, which is like uh, for, con for hardware consumer electronics, is the Oscars of consumer electronics. We have won more best of CESs than any other company that has exhibited over there for the past 10 years, whether it's uh, Motorola, Samsung, or, or whatever. Um, and it's odd because we're a really tiny company compared to to, the, to the, um, some of these really large companies out there. And you're talking about tens of thousands of exhibitors, thousands of products being, I'm sorry, you're talking about thousands of exhibitors, tens of thousands of products being launched in that, in that three or five day, day event. Um, and that's one of those things that we, we believe, that we constantly want to innovate and constantly want to push things along. And uh, it takes a lot of R&D. You know, most of our dollars go back to R&D. Are we profitable? Yes. Do we charge a premium for our products? We are unabashed to say yes. We charge probably our prices about three to five times more expensive than, than um, you know, any of the guys out there. The difference, however, is that we take all that profit and we channel it back to R&D. Such that we are always constantly two or three steps ahead as opposed to anyone else and that's what we do. So you will see uh, new stuff uh, coming out. We've got a pipeline that, um, to kind of give you an idea, we've got a tech center that sits out of Austin that tracks technologies for us, anything from about three to five years. Uh, we've got three design centers, San Francisco, Taipei, and Singapore, that do product lines, uh, products, anything from uh, today to the next up to three years, where they, we have a roadmap that we constantly build. And, uh, so these are like your future labs, so to speak, right? When you, uh, the Austin one. Austin is uh, tracks technology. So, you know, they will bring in all the technology providers and, and create um, roadmaps or tech roadmaps to say, okay, this is where we think the trends are going. This is where this is um, headed toward, and uh, that's what we do. So for this, um, can you talk a little bit about your breakdown? Because we know that you focus a lot on R&D. You just mentioned that as well. But how yes. about marketing? You mentioned esports way earlier um, when we first mm -hmm. started. Sure. We know that you sponsor a lot of esports as well. So how do, you, uh, how do you split up the budget? So for us, um, as I think many gamers might be familiar with, we don't do anything, uh, we don't do any traditional advertising. You, won't, you, know, you generally won't see a, a, a razor ad in the newspapers, you don't see it on the, on the print media, if it is... You have all the tattoos, right? <laughs> yeah, we have the tattoos of 400 people or 500 gamers out there that go around with the tattoos and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, but generally we go by word of mouth, so we've got a very small but super effective marketing team. Um, but the rest of it, we believe in just focusing on the that I wrote the for you guys at the end there. So we have only a few minutes left. One, one question I also want to ask you is that, again, even though this is not really gaming-focused crowd, where do you see gaming startups fitting in into this larger ecosystem? Wait, hold on. So industry buzz. I hope they say something rude about me. Oh, then you can tweet about it, right? Then we'll have a lot of... Dude, you know, he's on a stage for such a long time. Okay, wait, that's clear. I'm sorry, I just missed it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, clear it, okay. I'm sorry, no, I was no, just no tw tweet it, Twitter opportunity now, right? Yeah, for curse words. Yeah, so one question is that, now specifically for gaming startups, because we do have uh, people here um, building mobile games, so more software. We do have, uh, again, some companies doing hardware software. So where do you see gaming specific and hardware software companies fitting the larger landscape of tech? 
Um, you know, I see mobile being a very big part of it. I'm sure you know there are lots of mobile app developers or mobile games uh, coming about. Um, I think being able to partner with large, uh, larger companies is uh, definitely one of those things that would help uh, companies. And that's one of the things that, for example, um, we've been lucky to, you know, and we want to kind of... So we've got a platform today where we talk to gamers, over a million gamers, one and a half million gamers out there on a daily basis. Um, we're getting games in front of them, for example. So I think, you know, we partner with um, companies doing their Kickstarters. And in fact, there was a Singapore-based company which we recently helped to... Uh, to put on the on the kind of our Facebook page and, and stuff like that, um, they're doing a fighting game, uh, and uh, you put me on a spot that I cannot remember. The oh, okay, name, so it's, it's okay. going to be embarrassing. <laughs> um, but it's got great artwork, and I and I a chainsaw accident incident. So, so I think it's it's um, finding great companies to partner with is uh, is uh, super critical. Um, on top of that, the gaming industry is growing gangbusters year after year. It's a uh, it's a rising tide of sorts. Um, but, of course, barriers to entry are pretty low. You're going to be jostling with a lot of um, other app developers and, and uh, you know, um, content providers out there. So I would say that um, really, you know, stick, uh, stick in there and uh, continue doing great things. So for the company, for example, you help. So how can companies here try to get Razer's help? Uh, just reach out to us. So, for example, let's say, you know, on Facebook, we've got about 5 million or maybe more, I don't know, 5 million fans and stuff like that. We've got... Um, tends, you know, uh, we, we reach out to gamers all the time. A single email blast from us, for example, reaches uh, uh, millions of gamers out there. Users of whom are really interested in um, gaming. And um, essentially, we would love to work with um, great product. So, you know, you can just write to us, tweet us, Facebook us, try not to stalk us. Um, but that works. So one very last question. Imagine there's no razor now. Okay, you didn't have razor. If I were to give you fifty thousand dollars US, what will you do with it? You can give it to me. Sure, I know I could. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. I think I think what I would do. Um, I'd love to start something, but I think the the important thing for us for myself and, and for the company and, and some advice I give to some of the companies that I, I, I kind of help from time to time is figure out what not to do first because there's always this um, insane need to, to get something started or to do something great, etc. which is important but sometimes it's best to take a bit of a step back and kind of evaluate everything out there and not to build something or, or start something for the sake of starting it but really understand that time is really the most important asset of, of anyone. And I'll take a little bit of time, I'll think about it, narrow down my options, be hyper-focused on one thing, drop everything else and forget anything else and just do that. Do you think you'll be in gaming? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it could be anything. I mean, I'm, I'm, there are lots of things I'm excited about. What I love about Razer is because I get to design things for gamers. So if I want to do a Killer Mech robot in the future, we could launch a Killer Mech robot under the Razer brand and it would do incredibly well because gamers like Killer Mech robots. We could be doing drone stuff. We could be doing healthcare to a certain extent. Maybe not. Maybe Cheetos for gamers or something like that, FMB. You know, it's, it's one of those platforms that I personally, you know, am passionate about and, uh, you know, uh, probably something like that. Okay, thank you so much for our time. Thank you so much, Mingyang. Thank you very much. Thank you.